The following content is provided under a Creative Commons license. Your support will help MIT OpenCourseWare continue to offer high-quality educational resources for free. To make a donation or view additional materials from hundreds of MIT courses, visit MIT OpenCourseWare at ocw.mit.edu. This is class four. Want to start with that simple neural tube that we saw already in this little creature, Amphioxus. The, the Lancelots is a, another common name to, to call that group of animals. And ask this question. Yeah. We don't have fossils of the brains. They don't brains. Brain is soft tissue, doesn't leave fossils. Uh, so how do we know about when most of our ancestors are extinct? How do we know anything about brain evolution? Somebody want to tell me? Yeah. How much can we tell about the brain from the skull? That's right, exactly. Another kind of. Okay, I can hardly hear you because of the background noise. And you can see evidence of that in skulls. That's right. So we know. Uh, but there's some other factor in that nobody's mentioned. Yes. Let's talk about development next time. We might get to it at the end of this class, but that's important. It's very important, and, and we will talk more about it. Did you have something else? No, you go ahead, since she's already... Exactly, and you know how we judge how primitive they are? You can do a lot from skulls if you have the skulls because if they're, they look the same as skulls. We can pretty much identify the species by skull details and skeletal details. Okay, and if they, they're relatively unchanged over, you know, millions of years, uh, we can get an idea how ancient they are. And then if we can get any DNA, we can actually just, this is of course fairly recent. You can learn a lot about their age because of the rate of mutations is fairly steady. And we can look, if we can get an idea what their proteins were like from the DNA, we can learn a lot about evolution. But anyway, uh, I have another question here. In the, very evolution of the cord in the early evolution of the chordate neural tube, what was it that led to the changes at the rostral end. We saw amphioxus. There's no real enlargement there. Now, it turns out there are genetic differences. There are differences in details of neural structure. But what was it that led to a, bra a real brain? <coughs> what is the basic thing about these bilaterally symmetric animals? Exactly. So, yes, and that led to the evolution of specialized receptor systems, which then required special motor control at the rostral end. 
So both the sensory analyzing mechanisms and the inputs came in through cranial nerves now, which turn out to be a little different from the spinal nerves. We'll be talking about both kinds of nerves quite a bit in the class. And then, of course, the motor apparatus they needed. But also, of course, they needed to maintain the stability of the internal milieu. And that also, uh, there evolved, even starting with amphioxus, there were secretory systems in that rostral end of the tube, the predecessor to the pituitary and hypothalamus. Okay, so... And the sensory inputs, the ones we think of the most, are the ones that come in directly to the, uh, the forebrain, the olfactory and visual inputs. And then I've already mentioned the visceral control that also involved that area. So here's my little sketch. The very simple neural tube. And then... Expansions at the rostrum end. I just sketched here olfactory and visual inputs. I think the figures in the book were a little bit better than this, but they were all based on these sketches. Uh, and then, note I have a couple of the hindbrain inputs. Most of the cranial nerves come into the hindbrain. Okay? There are cranial nerves for the midbrain too, but their motor output, the third and fourth nerves, come out of the midbrain. But the midbrain became important in other ways. First of all, it got visual input, as we will see. Uh, probably not the original visual inputs came there, but it also was a link between those forebrain structures, like olfaction, and the motor system, which was controlled by the lower brain stem and the spinal cord. All right. So let's talk about now expansions that occurred with these specializations at the rostral end. The brain starts to evolve. The hindbrain expansions in the cordyx resulted from the evolution of adaptive sensory and motor functions. What's an example of a hindbrain sense? Input that comes in through a cranial nerve into the hindbrain. Important sensory modalities. What did we just show? What do those What do those mean? Somatosensory. We'll be talking about the trigeminal nerve and <coughs> from the, the head region, especially the face. And then I have. Vestibular. I put vestibular and not auditory because vestibular is even more ancient. Okay. <laughs> At least we think it is. I mean, a lot of these things, there's a little bit of debate and it depends on the details they find in ancient skulls. And it's been very difficult to get the very early period pinned down. And I've asked you, there's a homework thing relevant to that, uh, you'll be looking on the internet for some, some of that data. Okay, so here now I've taken that brain with the three brain vesicles and I've showed an expanded hind brain. And uh, we should keep in mind that of course along with these specialized inputs coming in, uh, the brain evolved action patterns, movement control that was new too. When it's a genetically controlled, a genetically controlled development of a circuit controlling movement, we call it a fixed action pattern or an instinctive movement pattern. That's a term from the ethologists, but we can apply it to our discussion of the brain. So let's now compare the specializations for taste senses of a couple of fish. Where this, I like the illustrations from Herrick that we're going to show. Uh, these are the the Herrick brothers, uh, Clarence Herrick and C. Judson Herrick. They were brothers, and 
They certainly helped establish the field of comparative neurology in, in uh, America. Uh, it doesn't mean there wasn't similar kind of work being done in Europe uh, and possibly elsewhere in the world, but they have these beautiful illustrations of, uh, of fish. What is the sense? Remember? Did you read it? What's the sense that led to some of the marked expansions of the hindbrain? Not trigeminal, not vestibular, but something else. Taste. Okay? So let, these are the, to summarize the animals we're going to look at. Uh, I got the pictures from C. Judson Herrick's book, but they were actually all drawn originally by his brother. Okay, and this one I take for comparison with the others. The, the, if you just look at this brain, the brain goes from this lower arrow all the way there to the, the olfactory bulbs, which are this peduncle connecting the olfactory. It looks like eyes, but they're not. This is all central nervous system. And uh, the midbrain is actually the widest part. And behind it, between the arrows, is the hindbrain. Now, keep that in mind and look at these other fishes. This is the moon eye. Look at the buffalo fish. You know, you look at this and you're used to seeing pictures of human brain and you see something like this and you what on earth are we looking at? Well, we're looking at Changes in the neural tube, expansions for specialized sensory motor control. We call this in the buffalo fish the vagal lobe because the input to it comes through the vagus nerve, the tenth cranial nerve. Now, the tenth cranial nerve in vertebrates generally uh, carries sensory input from the viscera but the visceral sensory neurons get that input. The rostral part gets taste input coming from the throat, the palate region, and sides of the throat. Okay? In humans, there's a little bit of taste input still coming. <coughs> this animal has a specialized palatal organ that filter, they, they draw in little particles of the the debris, the mud at the bottom of lakes and rivers where they live, and they filter it. And they're basically tasting it. And there are specialized motor functions of that filtering apparatus as well, so they can select out the edible things in the water. And they don't need a whole lot of vision for that. They just Blood near the bottom and do their feeding. Okay, now here's another animal that you're probably more familiar with, catfish. This would be like the bullheads many children catch when they go fishing when they're kids, but there are many other catfishes. Uh, again, strange looking brain. But now the end brain's a little bit bigger. They don't show the olfactory bulbs here, just the stalks that connect to them. Uh, and then you see the midbrain is still pretty wide. You, you didn't even see the the midbrain here is not as distinct as it is in the as in the moon eye. There's the big midbrain with the two tectal regions. There's the moon eye. Here's the catfish. The midbrain is bulging out quite a bit. But now all of this is cerebellum. So he's more specialized cerebellum. But I want you to look at these bulges behind because they all get taste input. There's the vagal lobe. Much smaller than in the buffalo fish. Here it is in the buffalo fish. Here it is in the catfish. But this is all, this bulge is called the facial lobe because that comes in through the seventh cranial nerve and it's in this animal much of it in, is carrying taste input. Okay, and there, so let's look at their specialized taste system. 
There's a catfish. And this picture is illustrating just the seventh cranial nerve. It's a cranial nerve, and it is getting input from the head region, including input from these little marbles here that it drags along the bottom and is swimming. It's a taste organ. But what is all this? It's the seventh cranial nerve distributing over the body surface of most of this animal. He tastes with his body surface everywhere in his body. And it's all innervated by a cranial nerve. So that seventh nerve is now no longer just... It's coming into the head region, into the hindbrain, but it's carrying taste input from all over the body. So again, this animal is not depending mainly on his eyes feeding, but on his taste organs. And it's led to these enlargements. Now that point that specialized sensory functions require neural processing power and that entails enlargement of the <coughs> neural apparatus that accomplishes it. So structures get bigger. So now let's go up to the forebrain and talk about what I call the first expansion of the forebrain in evolution. What caused the forebrain to start to enlarge? The olfactory system, we think, has certainly led to its expansion. There's other things happening in the forebrain. I mentioned the neurosecretory cells. The caudal end is also getting the visual inputs. But the first real expansion of the parts of the forebrain we call the end brain, okay, the forward part of the forebrain, is because of olfaction. And I just note here that when you see drawings, I'm often going to, like here, I show, I show pathways on one side here and another side here. Keep in mind that almost always these pathways are on both sides. But if I draw them on both sides, the diagrams can get very complicated. So I often show them only on one side. But you have to keep that in mind throughout the class. We'll often show them only on one side. It makes it a lot clearer. Okay, so here you see olfactory bulbs and some of the connections of the olfactory bulb. They're coming in to more caudal parts of the forebrain. In this case, it's parts of the end brain. They're not going clear back into that predecessor of hypothalamus. They're coming to a part that became the corpus striatum. In fact, it's the most primitive part of the corpus striatum. And that area, the striatal areas, had outputs that controlled locomotion. How did it do that? Well, olfactory sense isn't doing the animal any good if it can't control his movements. And it controlled movements mainly by connections through the striatum that went from there into the midbrain. There were no connections to the spinal cord, no connections to the hindbrain. They, they were shorter connections, which is generally true in these primitive brains. Shorter connections. And here's an example of a striatal cell connecting to the midbrain, the caudal part of the midbrain. There's, there are neurons there that we know drive locomotor behavior. It's important even in humans, we think. And then that area has outputs down to the hindbrain and even in many animals directly to the spinal cord. All right. Uh, there was something special about that connection in the striatum that led to a property of the forebrain that is absolutely critical to its evolution. And that is this, that the striatal connections were plastic. They could be strengthened or weakened depending on the experience of the animal. So here's that animal foraging. He's smelling things, uh, tasting things. He's getting feedback about the area he's swimming through. 
So he learns whether they're good or bad. He learns whether that's something worth approaching or if it's dangerous. Sorry? Uh, that's another issue about neurogenesis and its role in learning. We we have areas important in learning. It's true the two major structures that learning centers on both have neurogenesis, the campal formation and the uh, olfactory bulge. But in fact, the changes the the changes I'm talking about here are not an area of a lot of neurogenesis in the adult. It's probably is. Those, that what you're talking about is happening in the tiny neurons right in the bone. Okay? So don't connect learning necessarily with neurogenesis. Okay? But when I say they're plastic, they probably does entail actual morphological changes. Most forms of learning do. Okay. It was the, this was the predecessor to habit formation in the higher vertebrates, including us. The corpus striatum, Edge, and Graybill has been studying for many years. It's a very important site for uh, habit formation. It's the reason that area has, like cortical areas, expanded in evolution. Okay, let's go back to the midbrain now. I said, what structure in the midbrain has become greatly enlarged in most predatory telius fish? And then I want to talk about the two major outputs of that structure. One descends and crosses the midline. The other has an uncrossed projection. So we've got another problem to deal with. Why do things cross at all? Okay. What is the structure I'm thinking of? What's the big structure in predatory fish? When you look at the brain, it's really obvious. There it is. It's a visual sense. It's the surface. It gets visual input. It's the optic pectum. And there you see it. And this is the barracuda, an animal you've probably heard of because sports fishermen like to fish for the barracuda. But just look. Here's the olfactory bulb. It's not very visible. When they removed the skull, they, they left some tissue around the olfactory bulb there. But there's the inbrain, which includes the corpus striatum and pallium structures. Because remember, it's still part of a neural tube. So it's a tube where the walls thicken and there's fluid in the middle. Okay? And the part above that ventricle we call the pallium or the cortex part below, which often develops quite differently, uh, is where the striatum develops in the inbrain. Okay. But there's the tectum. Here's a diagram that shows that its connection, a connection that dominated in these predatory fish, we're talking about a connection from the eye. Most all of it comes from the opposite eye in lateral eyed animals. Animals with eyes that sit out here. Even in a hamster whose eyes look about uh, uh, six, 60 degrees out. Okay? So there is some overlap in the visual field of the two eyes. They still have mostly a cross projection like this. It goes to the midbrain tectum. Okay? It allows an animal... Vision was so important and led to marked changes in the brain. It was one of the two forebrain senses, olfaction and then vision, because it gave something even better than olfaction did. Olfaction could respond to things at a distance, but look at vision. It could get advanced warning. It could escape from things. It wasn't just predators that this was important for. And <coughs> these, just another picture of it here, I point out that two major outputs that are so, so important in evolution of that tectum of the midbrain. One of them controlled anti-predator behavior, turning away 
and the same pathway not only controlled turning away, but it went to the locomotor system that I mentioned before. That same region that was getting input indirectly from the, through the striatum from the olfactory sense and triggered rapid locomotion. So now you have the means for the animal to respond by turning away and running. Not just running, which could lead him directly into the mouth of the predator. So he turns away and runs. But there was another pathway that developed as that path, this, this projection gained a topographic organization. They developed the ability to turn towards things. Very important for finding food. And of course for prey animals, uh, for an, uh, predators rather, it became particularly important. The only way they could catch prey is if they had a highly evolved system for rapid orienting towards the prey. And this is the main structure for that early in evolution. So then here this question, why do the pathways from each eye to, to the midbrain cross to the opposite side like this? Why does that happen? I've never read a neuroanatomy book that actually has an explanation. But I have an explanation because I think it came from my study of sociobiology and animal behavior. I pay a lot of attention to evolution. If you just start, the reason there's no explanation, even suggestions about why cross pathways develop is because people weren't thinking in a Darwinian sense. They weren't thinking of Darwinian evolution. Anatomy developed within the field of medicine uh, and they were concerned with humans and comparisons with humans, so they weren't primarily thinking of Darwinian evolution. Okay, I will just give you a very simple answer to this. Uh, we're going to go through it in more detail when we talk about the hindbrain, because it involves the nerve sensory system as well. Uh, this is just a little summary of the hypothesis, but to cut things short, they must have developed a cross pathway because it was more adaptive. It helped them <coughs> survive and reproduce in some way. So my proposal is it gave, allowed more rapid escape behavior. So without a synapse, the cross leads contact a descending pathway that controls escape behavior. And that's the proposal that I will develop when we get to the hindbrain, when we will study how somatic because it's not just the visual pathways that cross, the somatosensory pathways from our entire body are crossed. That's why everything controlling my right hand here is on the left side of my end brain. I didn't say all of the brain, I said the end brain, but also the midbrain. In midbrain and forebrain, we have cross projections. Hindbrain and spinal cord, we don't. Okay? So now let's talk a little more about that expansion of the forebrain. What's likely to have led to a second major expansion? It's already started to expand because of the importance of olfaction. Olfaction was so important in feeding, in mating behavior, in knowing whether an animal was a male or a female, you know, whether the female is receptive uh, for mating, and uh, so important in finding good food and discriminating it from bad food and doing so efficiently, not having to wait until you taste it. Yes. Speak up. Sometimes they are, but in most cases, 
it's when certain genes will disappear from the population of genes or in, in the pop, those genes will disappear and others will be preserved if they, there's any slight advantage. And for something like escape behavior, it only has to be small fractions of a second can make the difference between being caught and getting away. And it's because of that, if you just watch the films on WGBH of escape behavior and predatory action, and look at the high-speed films they need, and you realize how split-second timing makes all the difference in survival. And that's what I'm basing this kind of thinking on. But we will bring this up again, and we'll talk a little more about it. I just want to give you an overview now of these brain expansions. Uh, the second major expansion, another equally important, we had to have a forebrain already. We know it must have been olfaction that led to its expansion. But we know now the forebrain is far more than an olfactory system. Other senses came into the forebrain. I already mentioned a big advantage now to the olfactory connections to the striatum. They were plastic. The connections of the visual system to the midbrain, as big as it was, were they plastic? Not in the same sense. There's short-term plasticity, habituation, sensitization. It doesn't last very long. But the kind of learning that allowed habits to form, they're long-lasting habits. The other senses, I think, in evolution, started coming into the invading the embryo for that to take advantage of that system. They come directly to the striatum. Okay? There are visual paths, and most of them come this way. Here's a, a link in the midbrain. It's growing to neurons in the, what we call the tween brain. Most of them don't go directly from midbrain. Almost always they go through the link there. And these then go into the, the end brain, the striatum, but also the pallium. Okay? Let's just talk about the striatal ones, because that's the one we've talked about already. If there's great advantages to be able to learn, remember, habits based on visual input and auditory input and taste input and so forth. Input coming from more caudal structures. Now, the visual input, some of that came directly into the tween brain. The eyes actually evolved from the tween brain. So, this pathway I'm showing from the midbrain certainly wasn't the only one carrying visual information into the striatum. Some visual input went right through a part of the diencephalon we call the, the subthalamus which projects directly to the striatum, as does uh, the older parts of the, of the thalamus. All right. So I think that's what led to the second expansion. Okay? Then I say a third major expansion of the forebrain has occurred in mammals, apparently because of the evolution of another structure. You should all know what that is. What's the, what, what is the... Huge part of the human brain. The neocortex. Okay. And and that what is it what in a thumbnail here does it do? I'm mentioning here the various functions that led to these changes in the neural tube. But the one that involves neocortex is this last thing. Systems for anticipating events and planning actions, the things we call the cognitive systems. I'm not going to mention communication, language, and all of that. That was a very specialized thing that happened in humans. I want to, this is mammals in general. Okay? And we, those, I'm describing here those systems for anticipating things. We call it on the sensory side, sensory images, and I use it very broadly. 
we have auditory images, visual images, uh, some of the sensory images, and for planning and preparing for actions. All non-reflex types of functions involving some kind of internal representation of the external world. And that's what the neocortex is specialized for. And I hear mentioned something you'll hear a number of times in the class, that yes, some animals don't have very much of what like a neocortex, like the birds, but non, there are non-neocortical structures that accomplish similar functions because they have connections like the neocortex. So we'll be encountering that and discussing that a little bit uh, as the class goes on. So this was the third major expansion. And it was the neocortex that expanded, especially, I just mentioned here, the part in the higher animals especially the primates, but other animals too, that expanded the most, certainly in primates, was the, what we call the association cortex. And I developed the idea in the book that that association cortex that's expanded the most in more recent evolution is actually, it has properties like the earliest cortex, the earliest pallium, not the more specialized cortex that evolved in between. Okay, but you'll see my reason for that as we go on. Uh, and of course, as the cortex expanded, the cortex projects to everything. It projects heavily to the corpus striatum. That led to expansion of the striatum. It projects to the cerebellum. It led to expansions of the cerebellum. So here I just depict that. I take this primitive animal with a somewhat expanded forebrain a pretty big midbrain, and I show how that endbrain grew. It grew a lot, and this is like would be like a, a rodent that we study in the lab. And along with that, the cerebellum expanded, and that's a correlation that's pretty strong. Okay, the bigger that forebrain gets, the bigger the neocortex gets, the bigger the cerebellum. And I mentioned other functions here that I've not talked much about. Control the fine movements, especially with the evolution of distal appendages, the hands, the feet, especially the hands that can manipulate. That led to an evolution of one of these somatosensory areas that we started calling neo, uh, motor cortex, as well as the cerebellar hemispheres. But the cerebellum gets input from all different areas of cortex, including the association area. So let's just talk, we talked about expansions. Let's just talk a little bit about methods for comparing brain size in the various major groupings of chordates uh, and talk about a major result of such comparisons. What is the method I'm thinking of? Yes. Yes. We, always we almost always will take the ratio we talk about relative brain size because we're comparing it to, to, uh, to body weight. That's because the size of the body is such a major determinant of the size of the brain. Okay? Now, there are exceptions for individual structures. But in general, as body size expands, so does the brain. And uh, you plot brain weight versus body weight and it usually is done on log log scales like here not showing individual points here's a point for mammals you see they plotted here on the ordinate uh, the size of the brain and they plot the body size here here's the previous one here's the body weight in grams on a logarithmic scale here's the brain weight in grams of course, you can take volume just as well. And here, the different colors show the envelope of all envelope of points for many different species of mammal. They're all in that green area. Okay? And here, the purple area down below. It's lower in general, but it's still is along this a diagonal line 
That's the cartilaginous fishes, the sharks, and the rays. And here, with a upper part that's getting, getting close to mammals, but a little bit below is the birds. Okay? And then, this is a very large group, the ray fin fishes, but some of those are almost reach the, the birds here, and even a little bit of overlap with some mammals. Okay. And then reptiles, and the lowest here are the jawless vertebrates. Okay, but again, a lot of overlap with that huge group of raven fishes. And this is just for mammals. And in this one, just a few points done to emphasize. In blue, they're showing individual primates. Uh, and they've selected a few other animals, like the porpoise, because it has, rel in relative terms, a very large brain with respect to its body weight. But if I tell you that humans have relatively the largest brain, it's because they're, the point is the farthest from that line. So relative size diminishes as we go in this direction and increases when we go in that direction. Okay? That's how you read those graphs. So you can see here the animal with the largest brain of all living creatures, the blue whale. There he is, up there. There's the elephant, also larger by far than human, but in relative terms, not as large. Okay. So that's the method. And uh, I would like to in a few minutes, because I've got a lot of slides for the next class, I want to start discussing it now. Uh, we've already mentioned maybe a few things. You talked about development a minute ago and wanted to relate it to uh, giving us some evidence about brain expansion, brain change in evolution. There's been a lot made of that issue. You'll hear the phrase that ontogeny recapitulates phylogeny. What does that mean? What do the terms mean? Uh, and what do we mean by a phylotypic stage of development? This has been very popular in the earlier history of neuroscience. Uh, it's based on this kind of picture. This was drawn not by the original discoverer, of the relationship, which was by von Baer, a contemporary of Darwin. In fact, Darwin cites the idea in his book, The Origin of Species, but I, I looked for it and found out he doesn't cite von Baer, even though von Baer, he cites Louis Agassi improperly. <laughs> but Ernst Haeckel took up that idea a little later and did studies and came up with these pictures. He's taking these species you see at the bottom, human, rabbit, calf, hog, chick, tortoise, salamander, and fish, all looking very different in, mo in many details anyway when they're born. But look at them very early in development. This is after gastrulation. This is after, well after, after neuralation. Okay, and they're looking pretty similar. The only trouble was that Heckel didn't look at every species. And sometimes he wasn't very accurate in the way he drew things. <laughs> so this is it's still a relationship. Heckel took it to extremes. This is the way he shows it. Very different in the early gastrulous stages. Then he said if they were a member of the same phylum, like the chordates, they all went through a stage where they looked like this. And then they developed differently into different species after that. 
And these were the pictures he drew just to illustrate the data for that. Okay. So even though there are really marked exceptions to it, the general relationship certainly leads you to believe that if you look at the nervous system at these early stages, they do look pretty similar. In widely different cortex. Even though they end up evolving quite differently in different species. Alright. So it leads us to at least expect many similarities in the CNS of all the vertebrates anyway. And these have been found. I mentioned cynodonts already. What is a cynodont? Why is it important in the story of brain evolution? Why do I bring it up? Cynodonts have been extinct for some time. What is a cynodon? They existed over a very long period. They precede most. Sorry? Uh, no, they're not dinosaurs, but they overlap with the dinosaurs. Yes. They did exist throughout the entire Jurassic period, for example, but earlier. Uh, they existed. They existed through four geologic eras. Yes. Exactly. The mammal-like, the mammal-like reptiles is the word, more general way we refer to them. These are the mammal-like reptiles. Okay. But yes, mammals appeared and evolved during the period of the dinosaurs as little creatures. You know, running around the forest floor uh, was to their great advantage to be nocturnal because so many dinosaurs were were diurnal and had very good vision. So to avoid predation by those big reptiles, they had to occupy a different environmental niche. And it was among the cynodonts that uh, we could say that the sketches I'm going to use were like a, an early cynodont because the later cynodonts are really very similar in many ways to reptiles, but skull features show them still not to be mammals. Okay? And they go by a number of different features to specify whether uh, how mammal like they are. Okay, well, we'll come back to this next time. We'll be talking about. An what I think is like a cynodont brain, but you could also call it like a, an amphibian brain. Uh, the sketch would fit either one. <laughs>